Please take your copy of God's Word. Let's turn together to Genesis chapter 32. Genesis 32. Of course, the text is printed in your worship booklet if you're using that. Uh, but we've come to really a bookend moment, as I wrote in the first word on worship. In chapter 28, as Jacob is heading off from his home, he ends up at Bethel, uh, where he has this vision of God. Um, here in chapter 32, 20 years later, returning back home, he wrestles with God. Uh, and in, in between, he has been come to realize how faithful God has been to him all along the way. One of the things we'll see this morning is even as Jacob wrestles with life, God is using those very wrestlings in order to wrestle with, with Jacob, in order to get a hold of his heart, which is another reminder that God will do whatever is necessary in your life to get a hold of you. He just will. You're too important to him. He loves you too much. He will not let you go your own way. And so we need to pay attention then to what God's doing in our lives, but above all, what God's doing for us right now as he speaks his word to us. Let's ask him to help us. Would you pray with me, please? Almighty God, we do bless you. We bless you for your kindness that you do not leave us alone, but you continue to pursue us by your grace to wrestle us and to win us and to woo us in and through Jesus Christ. And Spirit, we ask then, come, come and use your word in our hearts and lives so that we might see glorious riches uh, of your gospel here in, in these pages. We pray that you would do this in Jesus' name. Amen. So Genesis 32, beginning verse 1. Jacob went on his way, and the angels of God met him. And when Jacob saw them, he said, this is God's camp. So he called the name of that place Mahanim. Then Jacob sent messengers before him to Esau, his brother, in the land of Seir, the country of Edom, instructing them, Thus you shall say to my lord Esau, Thus says your servant Jacob, I have sojourned with Laban and stayed until now. I have oxen, donkeys, flocks, male servants and female servants. I have sent to tell my lord in order that I may find favor in your sight. And the messengers returned to Jacob, saying, We came to your brother Esau. And he is coming to meet you, and there are 400 men with him. Then Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed. He divided the people who were with him and the flocks and herds and camels into two camps, thinking, if Esau comes to the one camp and attacks it, then the camp that is left will escape. And Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham, and God of my father Isaac, O Lord, who said to me, return to your country and to your kindred, that I may do you good. I am not worthy of the least of all the deeds of steadfast love and all the faithfulness you have shown to your servant. For with only my staff I crossed this Jordan, and now I have become two camps. Please deliver me from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him, that he may come and attack me, the mothers with the children. But you said, I will surely do you good and make your offspring as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for multitude. So he stayed there that night. And from what he had with him, he took a present for his brother Esau, 200 female goats and 20 male goats, 200 ewes and 20, lamb, 20 rams, 30 milking camels and their calves, 40 cows and 10 bulls, 20 female donkeys and 10 male donkeys. These he handed over to his servants, every drove by itself, and said to his servants, Pass on ahead of me, and put a space between drove and drove. He instructed the first, When Esau, my brother, meets you and asks, To whom do you belong? Where are you going? And whose are these ahead of you? Then you shall say, They belong to your servant Jacob. They are present sent to my lord Esau, and moreover, he is behind us. He likewise instructed the third and the the second and the third, and all who followed the droves. You shall say the same thing to Esau when you find him, and you shall say, moreover, your servant Jacob is behind us. For he thought, I may appease him with the present that goes ahead of me, and afterward I shall see his face. Perhaps he will accept me. So the present passed on ahead of him, and he himself stayed that night in the camp. The same night he arose and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his eleven children, and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. 
He took them and sent them across the stream and everything else that he had. And Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, let me go for the day is broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then he said, your your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, saying, for I have seen God face to face, yet my life has been delivered. The sun rose up upon him as he passed Penuel, limping because of his hip. Therefore, to this day, the people of Israel do not eat the sinew of the thigh that's upon the hip socket, because he touched the socket of Jacob's hip on the sinew of the thigh. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So in early 2009, the movie The Wrestler came out. Now, I have to confess, I didn't see the movie because of its R rating, but I do know a couple of things about the movie. It starred Mickey Rourke uh, as an aging professional wrestler whose name was Ram Robinson. Uh, Ram was popular in the 1980s, once a huge draw, but but by the time the movie unfolds, he's limited to doing uh, kind of limited exhibitions in the New Jersey Shore where he was the most popular and he was working part-time in a butcher shop. But he's finally offered a chance to to come back to the ring. It was going to be for the 20th anniversary of his battle royales with his nemesis, the Ayatollah. But but, but because of his heavy steroid use, he was actually in danger of of a heart attack if he went back into the ring and to to fight. And so the, the tension of the movie is driven by by Ram's evaluation of his place in society, or, or lack thereof, and, and how his identity was shaped and formed from, from being in the ring, and whether that was worth going through, even though it might kill him. Well, so much for the movie. I mentioned the movie because it had a great song. Uh, the song was actually written by Bruce Springsteen. Uh, and, and the song for the movie talks about the, the brokenness that the wrestler faces. But when you listen to the words, you come to realize that this brokenness is not unique to the wrestler. In fact, all of us experience this kind of brokenness as we wrestle with life. The song ends with the words, these things that comforted me, I drive away. This place that is my home, I cannot stay. My only faith is in the broken bones and the bruises I display. Have you ever seen a one-legged man trying to dance his way free? If you've ever seen a one-legged man, well, then you've seen me. In a very real sense, if we're honest this morning, we, ha- we have to say, we know what this is like. We know what it's, it's like to feel as though all we have to display for our life in this world are broken bones and bruises as we've tried to navigate through this life and we just keep getting hit over and over again. We, we know what it's like to limp through life because we cannot receive the comfort and love that others want to give to us, but we cannot receive. We know what it is to wrestle with our lives, running as though we're just on one leg, punching the ear as though we only have one arm. We can say... If you've ever seen a one-legged man, if you've ever seen a one-legged woman, well, you've seen me. We can say this, and so, of course, can Jacob. Because what we find in our text this morning is, is how Jacob wrestles deeply. He wrestles profoundly with his life, and he feels as though it's gonna kill him. In many ways, he does die this night. This night in which he wrestles with all that's come upon him and ultimately wrestles with God. His self-sufficiency, his self-promotion, his self-direction, 
all the trust he puts in his brilliance and his ability, it all dies this night. And that's because Jacob, is, as he's wrestling with life, he's actually wrestling with God. God is the one who's wrestling with him. God is determined to conquer Jacob and through conquering, ultimately to change him. But, he, but God can only change Jacob, and he can only change you and me as he brings us to the very end of ourselves, to the end of our trust in our self-sufficiency, in our ability, in our brilliance, in our position, in our power, in our privileges, and all the things we put our trust in. All too often, God has to bring us to the very end of that. He has to conquer us in order to transform us. That's what God is doing in your life. He's wrestling you to the ground, not to harm you, but to transform you. And that's what he's doing here with Jacob. In the midst of all of this wrestling, he is determined to make Jacob new and beautiful. And he does this even in the midst of how of, of Jacob wrestling with his own life. I mean, when, when God tells Jacob to go back home, as we saw two chapters ago, it's not necessarily the, this welcome directive, as we saw last time. It's actually a really hard thing, a really difficult thing, because the hard thing that God has asked Jacob to do is to go back, to, go back home and go back to his past in order to confront it. Who's, who's standing there in the past? Esau. And the last time Jacob saw Esau, Esau wanted to kill him. And that's clearly on Jacob's mind. He's just had this amazing vision, yet again, of God's angels. He calls the place Mananim, but after he leaves Mananim, he decides to take the bull by the horn in order to try to placate his brother Esau. What does he do? Well, he takes these messengers and he gives them instructions. Verse 4 Thus you shall say to my Lord Esau, thus says your servant Jacob, I have sojourned with Laban and stayed until now. I have oxen, donkeys, flocks, male servants, female servants. I have sent to tell my Lord in order that I may find favor in your sight. Now, in telling Esau these three, three things, Jacob is being hugely strategic. If you can read between the words, sort of translate what he's trying to say. I mean, when he says there, I have sojourned with Laban and stayed until now, what, what does that translate to? I've not been hiding from you. I've not been avoiding you, Esau. I've not been sneaking around trying to undermine you. This is what I've been up to. He says, then next, uh, I have oxen, donkeys, and all the rest. What is he trying to say? I'm not coming to get your stuff. I don't want anything from you. I'm not here to trick you. I have plenty. And then finally, when he says, I, I sent to tell my Lord in order that I might find favor in your sight, that translates as, well, let's let bygones be bygones. Let's start over. Let's, let's press the reset button on our relationship. But, but if Jacob was expecting Esau to respond positively to this, there was, there was a problem. And the problem comes in, in, in what the messengers say. You see it there in verse 6. We came to your brother Esau. Uh, and he is coming to meet you. And there are 400 men with him. Now how, how in the world should Jacob respond to this? He has just run from Laban who has chased him down with, with his own household of fighting men. They made a military covenant at Mizpah to, to have God as a witness so they wouldn't cross the dividing line but against each other. And now he's confronted by Esau and 400 fighting men. Is Esau bringing these men in order to somehow honor Jacob? Or is it more likely that Esau is bringing these 400 men in order to destroy Jacob? Well, Jacob wasn't sure. But based on their last encounter 20 years prior, he, he had a guess. He guessed that Esau was coming to destroy him. And so he forms two camps. He puts the flocks and the herds and the servants in one camp. And he puts his family in the other. And begins to strategize how, how to respond. But, 
But before you get there, the Bible does something relatively unusual, at least in Genesis. It actually tells you how Jacob feels. The very first words of verse 7. Then Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed. As he's wrestling with his life, as he's wrestling with the consequences of his past, of deceiving his brother, of deceiving his father, of taking that which doesn't belong to him, of, of going on the run, of being gone for 20 years, of having to confront this past now, as he's wrestling with this, his life and the problem that's set before him, he's afraid. He's anxious. He's deeply distressed. We know what that feels like. When we come into situations that we've been wrestling with for a long time and we come to the end of ourselves and we don't have the answers anymore, what's our response? Anxiety and fear. We're distressed. We're brought to the very end of our resources, the very end of ourselves. We can utterly sympathize with Jacob here, can't we? What does Jacob do when he's at the end of himself? As he's wrestling with life, as he confronts this problem that it really is too big for him to handle, what does he do? He prays. And this prayer is remarkable. Because in this prayer, you can see how Jacob is wrestling with life, but he, but he goes to the only place he can go. He, he's at the end of himself, after all. And so now he, he's running to his God. And he first calls upon his God as his covenant God. As the one who has been faithful through generations. You see what he says in verse, uh, in verse 9? O God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac. O Lord, small caps, that's Yahweh. O covenant making, covenant keeping God. Who said to me, return to your country and to your kindred. That I may do you good. Here he is at the very end of himself. And at the end of himself, when he's confronted by, by life that's too big for him to handle, where does he go? He goes to the God who's been with his fathers, his grandfathers, who's been with him, who's made covenant promises to him. And he calls upon him and he confesses his utter inability to deal with this situation. Indeed, he comes to recognize that any good in his life was the result of God. And his grace towards him. Verse 10, I am not worthy of the least of all the deeds of, of chesed, of steadfast love, and all the faithfulness that you have shown to your servant. For with only my staff I crossed this Jordan, and now I have become two camps. He recognizes God's grace in his life. And though perhaps he had, had not always been faithful to his God in terms of, of seeking his face, or perhaps of relying too much upon himself, now he's in a situation where he cannot run and he cannot hide. And he realizes it was all of grace, all of long. And so he asks God to directly intervene in this situation. And he confesses his deep fear of his brother. You see it in verse 11. Please deliver me from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him that he may come and attack me the mothers with the children why should God hear this prayer because God promised he's the God of Bethel after all in the final verse of this prayer uh, Jacob reminds God of what he said back there 20 years ago verse 12 but you said I will surely do you good and make your offspring as the sand of the sea which cannot be numbered for multitude it's an amazing prayer as Jacob wrestles with life and he's confronted by a problem that's too big for himself, he, he falls before God and he confesses who he is and he relies upon his grace and he asks God to intervene. He prays, but he doesn't just pray. He's Jacob after all. He makes a plan too. He, he plans and sends out this huge gift for Esau. When you total it all up, it's 220 goats and 220 sheep and rams, 30 camels plus their young, thir uh, 50 uh, cows and bulls, 30 donkeys. And he instructs his servants on what to say and how to take them to Esau in five different stages. Now this plan has some military strategy behind it. Because if Esau was going to ambush him with five, 400 men... As these servants came over and again, A, they'd keep their eyes on him, and B, it's going to be really hard to hide when people keep coming and bringing you gifts. In addition, uh, if this was a quick strike force, 
uh, he's going to be weighed down with all of this stuff, all of these animals, all of these gifts that have been given. Two, Jacob will have people who are loyal to him. In Esau's rear, uh, which militarily will create some problems for Esau. But above all, what this plan really is communicating is Jacob's sorry. He's sorry. He wants Esau to forgive him. He's paying tribute to Esau as his rightful lord. He wants to reconcile. And yet even with all of this, Jacob is still anxious. He's confronted this problem with prayer and a plan. But he's still wrestling with life and he feels vulnerable. He feels fearful. Verse 24 will tell you he's alone. Jacob was left alone. He's at the very end of his ability to cope with this situation. And guess what? That's exactly where God wants him. That's exactly where God wants you. At the end of yourself, of your self-sufficiency, your self-protection, your self-promotion, all of the ways you use your abilities uh, in your day-to-day world, and you think, here's another problem, whether it's relationally, whether it's in your marriage, whether it's with your kids, whether it's within the church, whatever it may be, whether it's this job promotion that you're looking for or this, this community office that you had hoped to, to gain for yourself, whatever it is, and you, you've come to a place where you can't rescue yourself and you can't solve the problem. And you're at the end. You say, God, I can't do this. That's where God wants you. Because as you are wrestling with life, just like Jacob, God's wrestling with you. In the middle of the night, Jacob can't sleep. He gets up and he's, he decides to make a further plan. He moves his family across the, the river Jabbok um, to create another barrier between Esau and his family, those, those persons he loves the most, and the persons ultimately who are going to be the fulfillment of God's plan to him, uh, promised to him that, that his, his offspring would be as the sand of the seashore. And then he's left alone. Does he drift off to sleep? Is he just simply lost in his own thoughts? Is he staring at the stars and the moon or seeing the clouds pass by in, the, in a, a bright night, perhaps? We're not exactly sure. The next thing we are told is that he is engaged in conflict. Right? Verse 24, and Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. Who was this man? That that had to have been Jacob's thought. Was this Esau who somehow found me and ambushed me after all? Or maybe was this one of his mercenaries that he's hired, part of the 400 fighting men who somehow tracked him down and and found him? Why was he under duress? And and who is this who's attacking him? Well, we have to remember that that Jacob's actually a, a relatively vigorous 97 years old at this point. If you add up his ages... And as a relatively vigorous centurion or, or one who's lived a hundred years, uh, this, und- this, this wasn't WWE. This wasn't the ultimate fighting challenge or anything like that. This was probably a relatively gentle wrestling, but it's still a real struggle. It's a real conflict between Jacob and this man. And as they wrestle, the man sees that he cannot overpower Jacob. And so so he conquers him another way. What does he do? Verse 25. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket. And Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Now, we should not be imagining here that this man used the atomic elbow and did a drop. Somehow got that hip out of joint. Oh! finally won or threw him in some kind of leg twist to pop the hip out of joint. No, he didn't need to do that. All he had to do was touch the hip. Just touch it. The hip was out of joint. And Jacob undoubtedly reasoned as he's wrestling there, any man who could simply touch my hip and throw it completely out of joint must be supernatural. And as Jacob is reasoning in those split moments This must be a supernatural being who can throw my hip out of joint. In his desperation and in his fear, he says, I need this one. If this person is a supernatural being, 
who is wrestling with me, he must care about me. And so I cannot let him go. I need him in the midst of this moment, in this crisis, as I'm, I'm about ready to confront my brother Esau, whom I have not seen for 20 years and apparently has murderous designs upon me. I need this supernatural being with me. That's why he says, I will not let you go unless you bless me. I won't let you go. He's clinging to him in faith. Clinging to him because this is clearly a supernatural being who has come to, to enter into Jacob's situation. And Jacob won't let go of him until he speaks the word of blessing. And sometimes that's what life is like, isn't it? We are wrestling with life and we discover that God is in the midst of it wrestling with us. And we are those who, who've confessed that the Son of Man has actually conquered us already. And as those who are followers of, of this, of this God-man, this supernatural being who's become incarnate man, we know that he wrestles with us at times. We know that he brings us to the very end of ourselves. We can name the ways in which we've been stripped of our self-sufficiency. And in those moments, it's all that we can do to cling to him. All we can do to asking him to intervene and to, and to bless us. And we won't let go. We're grasping hold of him because we know he's already grasped hold of us, as Paul says in Philippians. And it's in those moments that we come to the very contradiction of the Christian life. Because God must conquer us. He must strip us of everything, of our self-sufficiency and our abilities and all the different ways in which we can navigate life. He has to bring us to the very end of ourselves, to bring us down to rock bottom in order to rescue us and set us free. And blind poet George Matheson, he put it this way. He said, make me a captive, Lord, and then I shall be free. Force me to render up my sword, and I shall conquer be. I sink in life's alarms when by myself I stand, but imprison me within thine arms, and strong shall be my hand. That's what God is doing in your life. As he's trying to conquer you, he's actually trying to set you free from you. From all of the ways that you would plan your life and control your life and direct your life and run your life into the ground, he's trying to rescue you from you. And he won't let you go. He won't let you go. He desires to conquer you in order to change you. I mean, what does this supernatural being say? Jacob says, I'm not going to let you go unless you bless me. The supernatural being says to him, what is your name? Now, why does he ask him that? Does he not know who this is that he's wrestling with? I mean, when Jacob, when Jacob says, I'm Jacob, does it, you know, is the angel going to say or the supernatural being going to say, oh, sorry, I'm wrestling with the wrong guy. I was looking for Jimmy down the road. Sorry about that. I mean, why, why does he ask him his name? I, I think he's asking Jacob's name because he wants Jacob to confess what he is. Because remember, in the Old Testament, names are often a, an indication of character. And so when the supernatural being says, what is your name? Jacob is forced to say, deceiver, supplanter, heel grabber. But then the man says, what? He says, your name shall no longer be called deceiver, supplanter, heel grabber. But Israel, prince, the one with whom God struggles, the one through whom God struggles, for you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. Friends, what grace this is. What grace it is that as Jacob wrestles with his life and he's come to the end of himself 
and he can no longer rely on his own ability, his own ability to, to deceive and to maneuver and to manipulate and to plot and to plan. He's not even trusting in this cockamamie plan that he has with all of these animals going in five stages. He's at the very end of himself. He knows he needs this supernatural being more than anything else and anyone else in this entire world. And in his grace, when he says, I will not let you go unless you bless me, this, this supernatural being says, you no longer are a deceiver. You're mine. You're mine. God struggles. You are a prince. And as, as God is wrestling with some of you, he's trying to get you to the very end of yourself so that you will say when he says to you, what is your name? And you think of all of your sin and all of your sorrow in your past. And you might say, what is your name? Unloved. Forgotten. Liar, cheat, adulterer, idolater, loser, whatever it is you would say. God in his grace, when he conquers you and changes you, says, no, that's not who you are. You're mine. You're my son. You're my daughter. You're a prince, a princess in my kingdom. You're mine. Right? I don't know how you're wrestling with life this morning. I know you are. But hear the good news of the gospel. If you have eyes to see it, God is wrestling with you. He wants to change you. All you need to do is stop fighting and cling to him. And he'll change you. Because he loves you. Let's pray together. Almighty God, these things are hard for us to believe. It's hard to, for us to believe that in the midst of all of our wrestling, and in the midst of our trust and our power and our positions and our privileges and our possessions and all the rest, and what you really want most of all is to get us to the very end of ourselves so we stop fighting you. And we just cling to you so that you can rename us as your own. Lord, grant us a grace that we do not deserve. Grant us the grace of being drawn into your love over and again in and through Jesus Christ. For it's his, in his name we pray. Amen.